Welcome to Winning Conversations. Today, Tanya and I had the chance to sit down with our outreach director, Joseph LeMay. This conversation truly blessed me. It was full of everything from military history to his history with art and everything in between. He has such a cool, diverse story, and I think you're really going to enjoy this. So sit back and relax and enjoy this episode of Winning Conversations. Welcome, Joseph. We're glad you're here today. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you. This is going to be a good conversation. There's so much to your life and, and what God's done for you. So it's going to be fun to Going jump to the in. way back. Amen. Yeah. The way back. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm so excited. I want to hear first off your military history specifically, because I feel like you have some cool stories. You had like, I just, that's where I want to start. Oh, okay. Um, when I was in high school, I always wanted to go into the military at first. You know, I, I tried to be a fighter pilot, scored high enough, but at that time, they they were drawn back down. Vietnam was over. A lot of the Vietnam uh, veterans were retiring. So I just went ahead and went in. So I joined the Army in 1985. I joined the late entry, went to uh, the 2nd Infantry Division, and I was in the 2nd of the 61st Air Defense Artillery, which I, I was a Stinger operator, which is a handheld missile that the... Uh, infantry uses. So I went over to Korea. I did a year and a half over there, and then I just spent the rest of my two years over there. I, I went ahead and extended. So while I was over there, I got school money, got out, came home, went back to school. And then about halfway through school, I decided, you know what, I want to go back in the Air Force. So I could have uh, tried a couple of things, but I went into uh, missile combat crew member, which is basically ICBMs. So I went into that and so I, after I what got out of school, ICBMs? What's <laughs> it's that? An intercontinental ballistic missile. It's a nuke missile. Oh. So you, you shot off nuclear, nuclear Well, we weapons? test launched them. Our job wow. was to try to make the enemy this afraid. Yeah. This, is, this is awesome. Okay, continue. So you were the intimidator. <laughs> that's exactly it. That's, what the, that's their whole purpose for them, is to intimidate. I got you. And uh, what we would do is, is uh, I did four years up in Montana, up in one of the missile launch squadrons. So I sat underground, me and another uh, crew member, and we monitored 10 missiles. We could monitor 50 missiles, but we monitored 10. And if the order came down from the National Military Command Center, we would follow procedure orders and launch those guys. 30 minutes or less. They're and, highly, and let me tell you, they're highly accurate. So, Wow. With a 98% or better alert readiness. So let's just say there's a lot of good men and women out there that are sitting underground, you know, just monitoring those missiles, yeah. can target them at any time, and... Uh, they're very effective. So without breaking security clearance or anything like that, did you ever actually have to fire them? No, but we would test launch them. So after okay. I did my four years in Montana, I went to California. That's where I met Charlene. Oh, and so okay. what we did is, is we would take a live missile from one of the three missile bases, and they'd take the bomb off. They'd, they'd send it down to uh, California. We'd have guys that would put it back together, and then they'd put all kinds of instrument packages on it and a fake bomb on it, and we'd shoot it off. Toward the South Pacific, which is down in the Kwajalein Islands, we got targets down there, which is about the equivalent from about here to uh, places over in Europe. I'll just say that, yeah. <laughs> and over in Russia, yeah. it just and so, it's really insane. Yeah, okay. yeah, and so the warheads they're suborbital, so it's almost like throwing a rock into the air. Okay, you aim for a window in the sky, and it just shoots, and once it goes, it goes through that little window that you make that you aim for, and it goes suborbital, and then it just comes down at about Mach 27, and it's pretty accurate. It uh, gets very close to its target. I mean, that's just a whole other world. Like, I have no yeah. frame of reference for, <laughs> besides the movies, which I know aren't accurate. But So after California, then what? Well, after California, then I got into the space side of uh, the Air Force, which is now he says a new casually. space side. He's like, oh, it's just... <laughs> yeah, they made a new branch uh, under President Trump. It's now called the Space Force. There was a lot of talk of it going on when I was in the military, but I never thought I'd see the day that it would happen. And so the jobs that I did, I worked at radars where we would monitor satellites. I worked at Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And our job there was to look for sub-launch ballistic missiles. But since nobody's shooting ballistic missiles at the United States... Mm -hmm. You, <laughs> you look at satellites. So we monitored and tracked satellites in orbit. Um, then I went to Diego Garcia and did GIAG, which is a ground-based electric optical deep space surveillance. So we watched geosynchronous satellites, which are satellites which are far enough in orbit that they move at the same rate as the Earth moves. So it's almost like they're stationary in the sky. So we would look at those and some other deep space objects that would be in orbit. 
of all the things you did in the military, what was the thing you loved the most? Oh, the Pentagon. That that was the most fun okay. assignment. It was the last one. Okay. Yeah, the last assignment I had, I got to go to the National Military Command Center, and I got to work with uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and I got to work at the top of the nuclear triad. So we were the ones that would be giving orders to the bombers, the subs, and the ICBMs. But since we're not playing war and actually doing real nuclear war, we would do other things in the command post. So we would work for the chairman and update him on things going around the world. And that was your favorite? Yeah, that was a favorite. That's where you really learn about the military. When you get to a squadron, you're so focused on your job, you just see your job and that's it. But when you get to the Pentagon, you get to see the whole picture. You get to see how all the forces work together and uh, how it comes down from the top from the National Military uh, Command System. How long were you there? I was at the Pentagon for three years. It was a fun assignment. Got to go overseas also. I uh, got to do an exchange with uh, the United Kingdom. So I got to go work for their headquarters and do space stuff over there with them. And they sent someone over to Peterson Air Force Base from the Royal Air Force, and they got to work with us. So I actually got to work with the Royal Air like Force. A, like an exchange. Yeah student situation you know how they yeah are. yeah pretty much yeah, but exchange fun. at the highest at levels the of highest our highest level yeah <laughs> that was fun i got to see a lot of neat things did you go to school what did you go to school for when you went back to I school i went to school are you ready for this yeah art <laughs> for design okay. yeah okay we were trying to figure <laughs> out how no. mr military <laughs> is also like accomplished artist so well, like you, you got alan bean who's an astronaut okay yeah. he was an air force officer and he was also a, a accomplished artist so I like to do art more for peace and more for relaxation. To me, art is fun. So it was difficult for me sometimes to actually do it, to actually work for somebody to do it because okay. I had more fun doing it than I did actually sitting down and trying to design things. This is correct. I had to do a quick Google search so I didn't sound dumb. Alan Bean is the one that took the moon like rocks and did paintings with it. Is that he, right? He did all kinds of art stuff. I think I've, I've, seen, I've seen rocks? that one specific. He had like... On like their shoes, just like particles of the moon and incorporated that in his artwork. Is that right? Uh, that's a new story on me. I, I haven't think read about that. But. I saw it at the Fort Worth um, Science and History Museum. They did like this whole exhibit. And that's incredible. I read about him. Yeah. Which I just think it's, it's so fun. So interesting how you have this incredible military background and then art is just like thrown into and you are a gifted artists like this is this is this a is, real gift not. this is a gift no you are this is a god-given gift on yes. your life yeah and just it just feels so random but so cool and so interesting so you took that time you went to school and you went to school for art but then you jumped back into the military and went all the way up to the pentagon yeah and it was neat having art as a background i got to meet a lot of interesting people and do pictures for them one of the guys I got to meet was Hap Halloran. He was a navigator on a B-29 bomber that got shot down over Japan. Mm -hmm. And so he was a prisoner of war for the last couple of years of the war. And he got out and he came to our base when I was at Montana. And we got to talking. And so I did a picture for him and his family. So he sent me pictures and autographs and things like that. It was, it was a really interesting story. I did a couple other pictures for guys that were in the military. Uh, F-105 pilots and uh, F-4 pilots. Thunderbird pictures, stuff so like that. Cool. So it was fun. Got their autograph. Whoever was flying for the Thunderbirds at that time, they came to Montana. So I did a picture of the number four and the number three guy. Did you have a passion for art when you were a kid? Yeah, I used to draw all the time when I was little. I'd go out and draw birds and, of course, airplanes. Yeah. And yeah. Military things. So you took two, your two passions and you, like, meshed them together yeah, pretty much. in that time. Yeah. It was when I was at Diego Garcia when all of a sudden I started feeling the pull to go into the ministry. And okay. so that's where the ministry came in. So I was about the 15-year mark in the Air Force. So I was a major at the time. And I was over there. You know, John was on the Isle of Patmos. Well, I was over at Diego Garcia, which is a little island in the Indian Ocean. It's owned by the British. It's run by the U.S. Navy. The American uh, Air Force has the mission there. And it's populated by Filipinos. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. That's diverse. Yeah, oh, for sure. Very diverse. <laughs> so tell us, tell us how these two worlds meet Jesus. You know, it's funny. Um, when you get born again, you have a sphere of influence. Uh, and you have something to say. You have a testimony to say. So when I was in the Air Force, I just sat down with the Lord and I realized that I have a story that I can give. So I would share my testimony and I would talk about Jesus. Uh, for instance, when we were on Diego Garcia, even though I was commanding that small detachment there, uh, I got to know the Filipinos that were there and they had a little church. 
And so there was a lady named Mother Melita, is what we called her. And everybody adored this lady. So we just got together one day and just decided, why don't we just go out and start evangelizing? So we evangelized on that entire island. Now, my wife and I, when we were in Cape Cod, we got married uh, just as I went over to Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And there was a guy named Tommy Zito who came there, who was an affiliate with Rodney Howard Brown. And he's got his own evangelistic ministry there. And so he came there at this little storefront church that we were at. And as they began to talk to us about the Lord, that's when I got the idea with the Holy Spirit, me and Charlene, to just start going out and evangelizing. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, to tell you, we went out and evangelized. <laughs> I mean, every weekend we were out on the streets, at the shopping malls, at the movie theaters. Uh, same thing, we went to England. We hooked up with Elam Christian Center, uh, Pastor Regender, uh, Buxton, the Buxtons, Pastors Buxtons was their name. And so we went out and we evangelized when we were in England, when I was doing that exchange program with uh, the United Kingdom, with the Royal Air Force. And so we would go to all the different little uh, cities, the little suburbs that were around in London, and we would just evangelize to everyone. You know, America used to be the melting pot, but England is now is the, the melting yeah. pot. Yeah. Because there were just so many people from so many different nations there. Saw a lot of salvation, saw a lot of healing, saw a lot of things that the Lord did. So it was exciting. So when I went to Diego Garcia, which was the assignment after the United Kingdom, I sat there, and I, I had a lot of encounters with the Lord. That was my Isle of mm-hmm. Patmos, so I spent a lot of time with the Lord there. Awesome. They say three things when you go there. People either get drunks, or they turn into hunks, or they, or they become a monk when they go there. <laughs> that was the three things they said when they told me when I got to Wait, Diego Garcia. Say that, drunks? Yeah, you can either be a drunk, because guys will just go to the bar and drink a lot, or you become a hunk, where guys just went to the Workout. gym and they exercised all the time. Or you could become a monk. That's where everyone just decided to get close to the Lord. Those were the three things everyone observed that's about people. That's hilarious. Got there. So I went to the to the monk side, and so that that's where so I started funny. spending time with the Lord. Oh, well, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is so funny. So you were doing all that evangelizing while you were on assignment. Yes. And it was fun. It was rewarding. And that's when I learned that there's two reasons why people don't evangelize. Either one, they don't know how, or two, they're afraid. Yeah, but once you right. step past that barrier and you just let the Holy Spirit lead you and guide you, he'll, he'll show you your sphere of influence and he'll open up doors and opportunities for you to minister. If you're willing. If you're willing, yeah. yeah. And if you'll just listen to the Holy Spirit, people will start talking to you. And at some point, they'll be to your entrance. The Holy Spirit will mm-hmm. say, there, there's the entrance. And the door will open. And you'll get the opportunity to talk. But here's the exciting thing about evangelism, because I heard this from a man named Hutch Strom, who came to a church when we were in Cape Cod. And he said this. He said, think of evangelism as people as fruit. And he said, sometimes you introduce the Word of God to somebody. They're not ripe yet. So it's going to be rough. You're going to get rejected. But you've planted the Word of God. And so the ripening process starts. The Word gets in there. And then you go home and you pray for them. You just believe the Lord will send another laborer. And Paul said that. He said, you know, this person waters, another person does right. this, but the Lord gets the increase, right? And so it depends where you meet that person. Sometimes you'll meet the person when they're ripe, when they're ripe, they're ready. Mm-hmm. And so you introduce the Lord to them and like, man, they're ready for it, you know. But sometimes you get rejected. And I had a problem with that at first because uh, I didn't like to be rejected. <laughs> but then when that uh, evangelist told me that, it just changed my whole outlook. So I just want to encourage everybody that the Lord will open up opportunities for you. And just because they don't accept the Lord right away doesn't mean it wasn't effective or the seed didn't work. It'll yeah. actually get in there and start to go to work. And then the Holy Spirit comes in. And when the Holy Spirit starts working on somebody, that seed just grows. It's like an ember. It just starts to begin to flow and grow inside the person. And eventually another laborer will come by and uh, they'll open up and receive the Lord. Right, right. It's just our job to plant. Now, we've gotten 15 minutes into this podcast. We haven't even mentioned that you're the evangelism director and outreach director at Heritage. By the way. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay because uh, outreach and evangelism really is where you're at, your sphere of influence. You said that really well. It's where God puts you in your world is yeah. where you get to touch people's lives. Um, one statement that I've heard you say lots of times, and it's really part of the fabric of our outreach teams, is each one reach one. Yes. Tell us where that comes from. Well, I was with the Filipino people, and we decided to go out when we were at the Diego Garcia just to go out and evangelize. And as we went out there, I began to notice each one reach one. It was just something that we began to say. So um, it just stuck. So I've just kept it ever since I've been there. If you can reach one individual and the Lord changes their lives, then they'll tell somebody else. Mm-hmm. And the next thing you know, it's just, just a domino effect. Mm-hmm. That's does, why I like that. Right. How does it align with Heritage? Because everyone at Heritage of Faith has a mission. Um, there's three things that Pastor Justin says that, that we do as a mission here, and I, I kind of like it. You come to get an experience with God, and once you get that experience— then you get equipped. And once mm-hmm. you get equipped, now you can go out there and you can evangelize and you can actually show everybody the experience of the Lord. 
so you can engage the community. And uh, those three simple concepts are just awesome. And that's the idea for a church. That's what a Christian is. It means Christ is on the inside of you. And once you begin to realize that you have a light on the inside of you, you're a carrier of God's presence, right? You have a sphere of influence, a sphere of influence. Right. And you got something to say. And I tell you what, you'd be surprised when you open your mouth how the Holy Spirit will just give you words to say. And then he'll open the doors with individuals. So, and that's the whole concept of evangelism here at Heritage of Faith. It's not my job to tell you what to do in evangelism. The Holy Spirit will put it on your heart. And I have a number of individuals that come to me with an idea that they have for evangelism. So I work with them with it and we pray together and then I show them where to go with the Holy Spirit and what I've heard from the Holy Spirit. And it works. We got a young girl named Aaliyah Robertson Mm -hmm. and uh, she came to me with an idea. And so now she's working with uh, the Ryan YMCA with an idea she had to uh, make a garden and reach the community through a garden and share the love of the Lord through that with her uh, girl group that she's with. So we prayed about it. Hey, how about going to the Ryan YMCA? We went there. They loved the idea. So now they're working with her. So a 16-year-old girl that's awesome. is out there with an idea that the Lord gave her, and now she's working it. Right. And so that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's just too big for me to try to come up with every idea. When Pastor Justin said that the Lord told him he wanted 500 people in the church going out and sharing the Lord, I thought it was 500 was evangelistic say. teams. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, Lord, <laughs> like how, do how am I going to do 500 that? 500 teams. And so I did a lot of praying in the Spirit on that one. And uh, the Holy Spirit, that's when I started realizing Pastor Justin had to uh, correct me mm-hmm. and say, no, I, I want everybody in the church evangelizing. Yeah, like, right. Oh, man, that makes it easier. So, <laughs> oh, thank God. Uh, yes. 500 so, teams. Is, I mean, can you imagine yeah. trying to create 500 outreaches? I'm, I'm just happy with the ones we've got going yeah. on, you know, to keep those maintaining and, and working in the community. And, uh, but once everybody realizes that, you're a carrier of God's presence. you got something to say, and you do have right. a sphere of influence. And once you can begin to do that, once you can get over that fear of evangelizing, you can let the Holy Spirit lead you, and he'll open up doors and opportunities, just like you with mothers with multiples. The Fort Worth mothers and multiples. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Which, which was something Tanya did. She, she said, man, the Lord's giving me this idea. And not only did they embrace you, they actually made you their chaplain. Right. right. Which is That's cool. Something. Anyone can do it, and yes. you do it in in a way that works for you, in a way right. that brings out your giftings. Exactly. You it's know? true. And God puts you in places. I mean, I didn't have twins hoping that I would be part of a Moms and Multiples group. That was yeah. it. like, yeah. oh yeah. man, yes, I now now have the ticket in <laughs> to the group where yeah. I want to influence. It was, open. you know, you're just open, the door opens, and then you just walk through it, which is your life. Um, you, you've married so many kind of concepts, and I want to pull it together and get your thoughts on, I'm really curious how the military experience, your heart for evangelism and being able to reach people through art all kind of come together in how you lead. Well, this was real interesting because um, I saw how the uh, apostles would go out and they would evangelize or they'd go out and they'd start churches, right? And they go to all the different countries and nations. And I thought, well, what better way to reach the nations than in the military? Because I went to England, I went Mm -hmm. to Diego Garcia. I got to go to all these different places and evangelize, which was just interesting. But you take all the leadership things that you learn. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Leader is some, leadership is something that grows on the inside of you. It's something that you develop over time, and, and it comes from the Holy Spirit. And there's different styles of leadership. Uh, and, and you can see that when you, when you look at military figures or you look at somebody in the community that's a leader. There's different approaches, different ways to approach. But the best thing to do is, is when you're in command, command. You don't do it how you think someone else should do it. You just do it how you're being led by the Lord to do it. And some people will like how you command and other people's won't like how you command and you'll hear it. And so the commander is at the tip of the spear. So you're always one carrying the vision. So you're always the one that gets to pray and and carry that vision and and try to get that vision into everybody. So your job is to make sure everyone has that vision. And there'll be some times where people may not like how you're doing the vision. And sometimes they do, but I don't mind when people come up to me and tell me if they don't like what I'm doing or not. I consider that an opportunity to sit back with the Lord to see how I'm doing. All right, Lord, they're saying this about me. So if they're right, why am I not seeing it? And if they're wrong, why are they saying that? And they're not getting it. So I'll, I'll pray to the Lord about that. But um, I just try to get people to see the gift that's on the inside of them. I try to get to see them to see that they can actually be used by the Lord with that gift. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a young lady that comes to our church now who had an idea with coloring books, right? And she wanted to share Jesus through coloring. And we were able to work it out so that she could go into an, uh, a nursing facility, a nursing home, 
and they love her. She goes in there, she is kind to them, she brings the love of the Lord with them, and they color and they do activities, and there is Identity in Christ coloring book, and they learn about Jesus and salvations happen. So that's what I, I enjoyed that so much. I just like taking people that someone would say, there's no way this person could be effective yeah. and just be able to pull something out of them and then let them do what the Lord gave them a gift to do and then watch how the Lord works through them. And so that's it's, cool. Like, yeah. that's a cool idea that I feel like some leaders might be like, well, maybe you need to rethink that. Like, maybe let's, but you gave her the room to be like, yes, we're going to, let's try and make, let's make this work. Let's figure out how to make this work instead of like crushing somebody's idea. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're like, exactly. whatever the idea be, let's try and make it work. Yeah. And, and, and if you can pray it out and birth it out, and if you can, if you're willing to take small steps, you know, one step will lead to another and it'll begin to grow and develop. And that's how people grow. That's at least that's how I've seen it. You give them the opportunity all soldiers are green until their first battle. You can train somebody and train somebody, but until they actually go out and experience the combat, until they actually go out and start to do the actual engagement, that's where the real learning starts. Yeah. When you take teams out and you help them learn how to do ministry, maybe on a street evangelism level, how do you take them from that green, new, never ministered to anyone too confident in what the Lord's telling them to yeah, do. You just work with them. And here's the fun thing about it. If you'll come back from a outreach engagement and do what my wife and I do, and we'll sit down and, oh my goodness, we'll replay that entire conversation. And the Holy Spirit will point out things to you. He'll say, there's the door that I opened for you, but you missed it. Or this was the word I wanted you to say, and you were sensing it, but you didn't. And so what Charlene and I would do is we would come back from our outreach and we would evaluate everything that we did. Okay, Lord, tell us, where were we effective? Where were we not effective? Where did I miss it? Where did I get it right? And I would draw encouragement from that, and we would encourage one another from that. And that's what I try to do with other individuals. So I'll just let them go out with me, and then I'll just give them the opportunity, and then I'll just sit back and watch. And then I'll just say a word or two to them, or I'll ask them what the experience was that they had when they mm -hmm. gave that outreach to see how they respond. And then we pray about it. Um, it, it's exciting to see because everyone has a different approach. That's awesome. What are your future hopes and goals for our evangelism team specifically? Well, to stick with what we, what the Holy Spirit gave me, the seven areas of uh, influence and evangelism, there's business, there's media, there's science, education, there's government, there's family, and then there's the entertainment and the arts. Those are the seven mountains that uh, evangelists have learned and you'll read about that uh, the enemy tries to take control of. So I figure in every one of those seven areas, we have people here that are interested in mm -hmm. those. And so my job would be to continue to find people's gifts and talents and to see what their love and their passion is. So if there's someone that likes government, hey, let's go for it. Let's, mm -hmm. let's start getting involved with government. Let's pray. Um, we have individuals that sit on the chief advisory board for the city for the Fort Worth Police Department. There's other things that have opened up and it, it was just fun to get to work with the chief and to get to work with the uh, other assistant chiefs in the police department, like in government areas, to find a couple other people to go with me. And what we found was is we were able to sit down and effectively work with other leaders in the community, and we were able to actually help institute new training programs where police officers can learn how to de-escalate conflicts, you know, oh, wow. how to de-escalate a situation, you know, use of force, how to sit back and to uh, evaluate a situation and instead of relying all the time on, on their on their gun all the time, mm -hmm. well, why don't we rely on, you know, what's going on in the situation around us and, and try to focus on situational awareness. And so working with the police officers and working with uh, the citizens, you know, in that area of government and in that area of the community, we were able to see a big change in Fort Worth and we were able to see uh, a big success happen in the police force. Is there an area that you might want to get into a little bit more that somebody listening might here and be like, oh, I want to do this. And then they could, what, what's something, with well, you? There, yeah. there's yeah. what I want to do. And there's what the Lord wants to do. Uh, I'm finding that my goals and visions, um, some of them are strategic, some of them are long-term and some of them are short-term. And I just like trying to take it a step at a time, but I do enjoy uh, missions. I've always enjoyed going overseas. Right. That's why I joined the military. To me, missions is just the opportunity. I love travel. I've been to, to Poland. I've got to minister in Poland. 
I got to minister in prisons in Poland. I got to minister in a church in Poland. Uh, I've been on the streets and did street evangelism in Poland. And uh, I'll give you an example. There was a girl that had gone to a, I won't name the denomination, but she was not reaching God in that denomination. And she was at the point to where she was going to commit suicide. So she had bought all these drugs, mm -hmm. right? And she, and she was on her way home. That's her testimony that she shared with Charlene and I. She was on her way home, and she was going to kill herself. And as she was walking by, I just happened to be evangelizing on the street over there in Poland, in Poznan. And she heard me talking about Jesus and the love of the Lord just hit her and the Holy Spirit began to work with her. And she came walking up to the front and she accepted Jesus. And so these are the things that excite me is to go to other communities, go to other nations and uh, to see the Lord work in other nations. It's, to me, it's just exciting. That's what they used to do in the old days. Yeah, right. Um, they, not only would they go, but they'd learn the society. They, they, would, they would draw pictures. There's where my art comes in. They would draw <laughs> pictures of all the wildlife, and they would study all the different things of the country and then uh, help them grow, help them make cities, help them learn how to develop in the Lord. It, it, that's what I want to do. I like missions. That's where my heart is. But. <laughs> That's awesome. You mentioned your wife a couple of times, Charlene, and we didn't really get a tap into that story. So you said you met her in California? Yep, in California. Tell when I was at, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and she was working with a contractor there, and the Lord set us up. Um, I had just gone through a divorce and uh, got born again, and uh, met Charlene, and the Lord led one thing to another, and we got married in 2003. Huh. And so the Lord has just been with us, and we've done so many things together. And it's, I enjoy so much having her as a helpmate. The Lord has given her gifts and talents that I don't even have, and I draw and I rely on them. Uh, the Lord will tell her things, and I have to trust the Lord when he's telling her things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, well, we've just worked so good together. That's awesome. Does she have the same heart for evangelism? Yeah, she does. Yeah. Yeah, Charlene was on the streets with me everywhere. I'll give you a story about Charlene. There were a couple of bikers in Cape Cod that were actually cycling. And so Charlene likes to run. So she took off and ran beside them. I tried to keep <laughs> up with her, but she is ministering to them as they're cycling, and she's running beside them. And she ran about a good mile, mile and a half. It was it was one of the funniest things I've That's seen hilarious. in evangelism. I know. <laughs> I'm trying to picture I'm that in my I'm head. I'm picturing it, and I love it. That's, That's incredible. Awesome. <laughs> That's neat. That's a, I mean, she's she's kind of a, a quiet person in the in the seats, so it'd be fun to see her in that element. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, until she gets moving in the Holy Ghost, and then she goes. Yeah. I feel like she's one of the one of those people who she's very quiet, but every time she says something, it's something you want to hear. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Amen. Yeah. That's awesome. It was neat to hear that you, you guys, how God brought you guys together. That's sweet. She went with you all over the world. Where would you travel if you had an op you had a choice to travel anywhere in the world? Where would you go? Man, when I went to Poland, I just I was just so excited when I went there. Uh, just a wonderful community, wonderful people over there. Just a wonderful nation. Um, I had met a gentleman who was in the Ukraine, but he went on home to be with the Lord. And I thought about Ukraine, but Eastern Europe to me is just a place where the Lord will, just needs to thrive over there. I just think they're ready for it. I think they're ripe for it. And you see what's going on right now with the Soviets and oh, the Russian invasion. Yeah, I call them the Soviets because that's who's running the country right now is that old form of government. But um, I, I really see Eastern Europe as a place that is just wanting to hear from the Lord. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I've never been over there. It'd be super cool to go. Um, one question we ask every guest who comes on the podcast is their thoughts and what they hear, what they think about when they hear the term making winners in life. It's oh, kind yeah. of it's kind of our heart of our church. Like what we do and everything we do is make winners. So tell yeah. us tell us where you where This you is my out. idea. For everyone to learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit in every situation. That allows them to grow. And if they're willing to take each step to do that, the Holy Spirit will take them from from place to place. He'll grow them. I want them to, to be completely immersed in the Word of God. To me, that is the, the stepping stone. To learn how to walk in the authority of the name of Jesus, how to move in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. For them to learn how to receive all the promises of God by faith. To remain rooted and grounded in God's love so that they can, by faith and by His grace, successfully fulfill the call that God's given them in their life. And for them to embrace the community, uh, embrace what the Lord has given them. And I think that's how people grow and develop. That, I mean, that's what making winners in life to me mean. 
is for them to get into the word, uh, yield to the Holy Spirit, learn how to recognize his voice and learn how to yield to him. Well, that's we, how we grow. That's right. We are so honored to have you as part of our heritage family, really leading from from where your position as outreach director and helping our church become winners in life in those areas, especially as it relates to influencing the world around us Amen. as individuals. So thank you for pouring into our church body in that way. Well, thanks for asking. It's, and it's always <laughs> yeah. fun to talk about what I did in the military too, because a lot of times I'll, I'll give you a cute little story. Uh, we would go out there and we'd work on Christmas day and we'd be underground. And so the families were able to allow to go actually out to the missile field. And so they could actually come down into our launch center, you know? Oh wow! And so we'd let them come down and this, this gentleman brought his two children out there. Right. And so we're telling them all the things, all the different comm equipment we have and all the different things that were down there. And the guy was just impressed. And he looks at his little five-year-old son and he says, this is pretty cool. How'd you like to do this one day? And the little kid looked at him and he said, no, <laughs> he got, that dad got so embarrassed. Tanya, I couldn't help it. I laughed so hard. I mean, I just started laughing and laughing and laughing. I thought that was great. It's like, well, that kid doesn't want to do this, no, thank but, you. <laughs> but but some people will listen to you, some won't. So that, thanks for letting me talk about the military a little bit. I think bit. it's it's so interesting. It is it's so interesting. I was telling Tanya how you went from like these super high ranks to what you're doing now, but you took that all of that and use it in this area of ministry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's it's just so impressive it to is me. Impressive. I think it's awesome. One of the things that is impressive to me is that not only did you go from like a Pentagon general i don't know what was your title oh lieutenant colonel lieutenant, uh, lieutenant, assistant lieutenant deputy lieutenant, director uh, lieutenant of colonel. operations and then when you came here you didn't step directly into the role of outreach director no. you were our facilities manager <laughs> yes. he cleaned the toilets yeah he made sure the the grounds were taken care of that takes humility in yeah. a way that most people are like yeah i'm called to minister and i'm called to outreach but what we need is for somebody to make sure that the lawn gets mowed at the at the church yeah that's 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 humble how was will you just tell us how that was for you yeah it took a it took a little bit of adjustment i'll yeah. be honest yeah um i've been stung shocked um electrocuted yeah um doing all these things around the church you know learning how to uh, <laughs> to be a facilities manager when all that happened uh poison ivy just all those other things it was fun i thought i killed the trees i didn't realize crepe myrtles do that in the winter time i thought i killed them <laughs> when i cut them down and all that but um yeah if, if you if you're willing to uh, i think the word you said earlier was willing mm -hmm. uh Andy, and, and that's true. If you're just willing to let the Lord take you and, and lead you and guide you, he'll open things up. So humility is a big part of uh, development. That's awesome. Well, you have really helped us understand, one, some things about the military. I don't even know. Yeah. I mean, you were the intimidators in the yeah. military, and now you're yielding to God in a, in a position of uh, influence in our community. So Thank you again for joining us. We're really glad. Is there, before we close, is there any other stories that you have that we could hear? How many hours do you got? <laughs> <laughs> well, tell us maybe one of your favorites. There was uh, an outreach that Charlene and I did when we were in Cape Cod. And Charlene had, there was a lot of uh, people that came from uh, Jamaica and Haiti that were in Cape Cod at that time we were over there. And so Charlene was out there evangelizing, and she led this one young lady to the Lord. She was pregnant, and she was wanting to have her child in America. He'd be an American citizen, and so she was getting ready to have that baby. And so she was staying at these little cottages, and during the wintertime, nobody stays there because it's not summer in, in cold Cape Cod. It's, it's, but, but anyways, long story short, I, had, I took her over there to pick this young girl up. We were going to take her to church, okay? I want you to picture this. I'm in a vehicle and I let Charlene off and the vehicle comes up behind me. And so I think I'm blocking their way into their parking place. So I pull forward and then the vehicle comes in behind me. And so I pull forward again and the, the vehicle comes in behind me again. Finally, I come around and just swing around out of the parking area and the vehicle comes in behind me and stops. And there's this lady in there and I am trying to figure this out. What is the matter? So I roll the window down and I kind of look my head out and I just kind of smile and, I, and she rolls her window down and I say, what's going on? Is everything okay? She comes up and she grabs my arm and she starts rubbing it and she starts saying, hey baby, how's it going? Oh, no. Now, now uh -oh. all of the, this is, <laughs> now you got to hear this. This is so funny. <laughs> okay. All of a sudden, one of the doors open 
to one of the cottages that were there. And there was a gentleman that was in there. Now, we had just witnessed to this guy maybe a week prior. Now, he's staying in that cottage there. He had called an evening lady <sighs> to come, to come, right? She thought I was you the one him? that called. <laughs> no! So, so all oh, of a sudden, the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit light bulb comes on. I see him, I see her, and all of a sudden the light bulb comes on. And so now I'm going to have, the Holy Spirit gives you a door of opportunity. I'm going to take advantage of this. I said, hey, I came here to invite you to the church. Let's go on. We're getting in the car right now. We're taking everybody that we know to church. Hop on in with us. She goes, you're kidding. I said, no, I, I'm an evangelist. I'm a minister of the gospel, and we came here to take you to uh, church. All of a sudden, the guy that was in the house, I mean, not the house, the other cottage, he comes walking out and he starts saying, hey, I'm, you know, I'm the one that called. Well, she didn't want anything to do with him. So now this argument starts ensuing. It, it, it is just the most hilarious thing. And then Charlene comes out with a young girl that we're taking to church. You know? right. So she gets in the car and she says, what was that all about? And so <laughs> I explained it to her and she started laughing. So yeah, when you go out and evangelize, you'll be able to plant seeds in the most unique situations. <laughs> uh, seriously? <laughs> you just never know. Talk about a door Lord. opening. Yeah. Like well, our church was right by a bar. <laughs> in Cape Cod. <laughs> so I was walking in one time with this guy from Russia. His name was Vitaly. And uh, these two girls were walking in. And so they start making fun of us because they know we're going into the church. So I was like, oh, this is someone saying, what must I do to be saved? Right. So we walk right over to them. <laughs> that's what I think. <laughs> yeah, that's what they said. And so we go right into the, the right there to the bar door and we start talking to these two girls and they're thinking, yeah, you guys just want this and you're coming over to have all this. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit just had me start ministering to her to the one girl there. And I got to tell you something, the Holy Spirit just fell down on those two girls. And uh, it, it went from them trying to joke around and make fun of us to it, it turned into a really serious ordeal with the Lord. So uh, if you're willing and obedient and you'll listen to the Holy Spirit, you'll be out and about in shopping marks, markets, you'll be out and about, and the Lord will just open up conversations. And the next thing you know, He's leading you. So those are some funny stories. That's but like wild. I said, if you have an hour out, we'll be here. <laughs> right. So. I'm sure you're, you're a wealth of knowledge. And we really are excited to be able to sit down with you again in the future because these stories will probably never end. Yeah. And those are my favorite part. Really, one yeah. of my favorite parts of the podcast is hearing all these stories. So again, thank you, Joseph, for honoring us with your time. You. Yes, We're you. glad that you're here. Um, thank you again, church family, for listening. Obviously, this was a really cool conversation. We learned so much more about Joseph and his beautiful wife, Charlene and all of his military experience and how that melts. I just think it's a beautiful story, the way God uh, kind of wove all of your, not only your interests, your passions, but everything together. So uh, church family, look in our show notes. I'm going to go ahead and link some of Pastor Joseph's messages that he's preached here in the house, uh, specifically about evangelism outreach in our show notes. So if you want to hear more of some of those very cool stories and his heart for evangelism, check out those links below. And uh, catch us next Friday. Every Friday we have just an incredible conversation. And this one was one of our favorites. So um, check it next week and we'll see you then.